is an issue of Leadership Journal, and in it, it tells this story, true story. Sunrise was dawning when Los Angeles police officer Bob Vernon saw a red pickup truck speed through a stop sign. This guy must be late to work, he thought to himself. He turned on his emergency lights and radioed that he was in pursuit. The pickup pulled over and the officer approached. Meanwhile, in the truck, the driver thought, the cops already know. He was scared. He rested his hand on the same gun he had used a few moments before to rob a 24-hour market. The sack of stolen money was beside him on the seat. Officer Vernon said, Good morning, sir. May I see your... He never finished the sentence. The driver shoved his gun toward the policeman's chest and fired from inches away. The cop was knocked flat seven feet away. A few seconds later, to the shock of the criminal, the officer stood up, pulled his service revolver, and fired. The bullet tore through the door and ripped into the driver's left leg. Don't shoot, the thief screamed, throwing his gun and sack of money out of the pickup window. What saved officers, Officer Vernon's life was dozens of layers of Kevlar, the super strong fabric used for bulletproof vests. Only three eighths of an inch thick, Kevlar can stop bullets cold. Did you know that God has given you a bulletproof vest? That's what we're looking at today. The Bible calls it the breastplate of righteousness. Uh, in Ephesians 6.14. Now, the Roman soldier's breastplate was like a vest covering the front and the back of his body from the neck down to his waist. It protected the Roman soldier's heart, lungs, and liver. The underside of the breastplate was made of leather and the top was bronze. The breastplate of righteousness protects you from the fiery missiles of false guilt that Satan launches at you. Maybe you confessed some sin to God and repented of it, but Satan will dig it up again and again and again to hurt you with its haunting memory. Wearing the breastplate of righteousness is God's provision for your defense. So here's my first point in the message. Don't wear the breastplate of self-righteousness. To be righteous is to have the character of God. When you're righteous, you're acceptable to God. But how do we become righteous? Every religion in the world says it's a matter of striving to live up to a standard. It's all about doing your best and living a good life. You have to do certain things to be acceptable to God. It might be joining their group, getting baptized in their church, or living up to a list of do's and don'ts. There's a name for that kind of righteousness, self-righteousness. That's what every religion teaches. But Christianity is different. Here's how the breastplate of righteousness works. Satan tries to condemn you. He says, I know how you failed God. You're worthless to God. He despises you for all the ways you've sinned against him. You're a counterfeit Christian, and you're never going to make it to heaven. These are the devil's poisonous arrows, and he aims them directly at your heart with the intention of making you feel shame. Here is the book titled My God and I. It's the autobiography of Lewis Smedes. Now, Lewis Smedes was a professor of mine at Fuller Seminary. Let me read to you what he says about his boyhood that carried over into his adult life. As a boy, I was thoroughly convinced that God held his nose as he passed me by, and if, by chance, 
God gave me a second look, he had to resist an impulse to turn me into a pillar of salt. All in all, God seldom wore a happy face in my boyhood. And ever since, the sadness of God has come more naturally to me than the joy of the Lord. Boy, that's really sad, isn't it? Can you identify with Dr. Smeeds? I think we all struggle with shame, and that means we all need to wear the breastplate of righteousness. The big doubts that the devil injects into your heart are, are these. Am I even a Christian? Has God really forgiven me? If I die tonight, will I go to heaven? Then he wants you to conclude, judging by the way I've sinned, I, I think the answer is no. Now the devil has you living in shame, and that will interfere with your peace, your love for God, your witness, and your service for Christ. To defend yourself against those accusations, you need to be able to tell the devil that you're righteous. That's what the breastplate of righteousness lets you do. So you reply to the devil, you're wrong when you say God has rejected me and that I'm worthless. And the reason I know you're wrong is that I have a righteous life. So there is no sin on my account. Well, so far, so good. But what if the righteousness you're trusting in is your own righteousness? Then you're wearing the breastplate of self-righteousness and that breastplate is made out of tissue paper. Satan's flaming missiles will penetrate through your self-righteous breastplate as easily as a knife through a California peach. In Philippians 3.19, the Apostle Paul spoke of how before he became a Christian, he had a righteousness of my own. That's the self-righteousness. Now here are some marks of a self-righteous person. He or she says, <clears throat> I think God will let me into heaven when I die because I've lived a good life. You can't call me a sinner because I go to church, I pay my taxes, and I treat other people kindly. God will accept me because I'm a better person than a lot of other people I know. I'm not so bad that I need God's grace. <clears throat> I'm not spiritually lost, so I don't need Jesus to save me. Do those attitudes illustrate your thoughts? And if they do, you're wearing the breastplate of self-righteousness, and you're a sitting duck for Satan's flaming missiles. Here's why. Because self-righteousness is imperfect righteousness. Suppose you're 98% perfect. You might figure, okay, I'm a shoe in for heaven. But if God let you into heaven with your 98% perfection, heaven would then become 2% sinful and imperfect then it wouldn't be a perfect place anymore. It wouldn't be heaven anymore because heaven is a perfect place. Only perfect people can go to heaven. Only perfect people can go to heaven. And that's where the uh, self-righteousness falls short of perfection. Romans 3.23, you know that verse. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone is a sinner who needs Jesus to be his or her savior, and thus self-righteousness is a counterfeit righteousness. Romans 3.10 makes this crystal clear when it says, there is no one righteous, not even one. <clears throat> Now, suppose you're going to put some quarters into a soda machine to buy a soda. You put the coins in the machine, but no soda comes out. 
The reason? Well, turns out one of your coins is a Canadian coin and it gets jammed in an American machine. The Canadian quarter looked like an American quarter, but because it was foreign currency, the American machine wouldn't process it. Now, here are two quarters. I know you can't see this that far away, but one of them is an American quarter and the other is a Canadian quarter. They are so, so close to being the same size, but they're not quite the same size and I think that's how a soda machine understands to reject the Canadian quarter. So your self-righteousness is like the Canadian quarter. It looks similar to the righteousness of Christ and it passes for good coin down here on earth but when you get to heaven's gate it will be rejected. Heaven accepts only the currency of perfect righteousness. So don't put on the breastplate of self-righteousness. It won't protect you against the missiles that Satan will launch at you. So now here's my second point. Wear the breastplate of Christ's righteousness. The opposite of self-righteousness is Christ's righteousness. When you trust in Christ as your personal savior, God clothes you with the righteousness of Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.30 speaks of Christ Jesus who has become our righteousness. And 2 Corinthians 5.21 speaks of how in Christ we might become the righteousness of God. Now theologians speak of this as imputed righteousness. When God imputes righteousness to you, he gives you credit for being righteous even though in yourself you're unrighteous. Now why does God do that? Is it because he's a softy? He's just made out of so much love he can't help himself but accept you? No. It's because God sees you in Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, he was paying the penalty for your sins. That was God imputing or transferring your sins to Jesus. And now that you've trusted in Christ as your Savior, God imputes or transfers Jesus' righteousness to you. Jesus never sinned, yet he carried your sins on the cross. You have never achieved a state of righteousness, yet God has dressed you in the righteousness of Christ. After you surrender your life to Christ, God looks at you and sees you covered with Jesus' righteousness. Of course, it's not your own righteousness or perfection that God sees because you don't have any. But God sees the righteousness or perfection of Jesus covering you like clothes. Romans 13, 14 even speaks of this. It says, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. I googled the word righteousness in preparation for this message, and I came across a very interesting thing, namely, the Chinese term for righteousness. The Chinese term for righteousness is the Chinese symbol of a lamb and the Chinese symbol for me. And when you put them together, a third Chinese symbol comes up, righteousness. Now, really, that is what the Bible is teaching, that in order to be righteous, we cannot relate directly to a holy God, we, we have to go through Christ, who is the Lamb of God. And so when our faith is in Christ, God will, will see us in Christ, and that then we become righteous. You can Google the Chinese symbol for righteousness to read this for yourself. Now this is a good picture of the grace of God, as I was saying, the Lamb of God 
stands between me, the sinner, and the holy God. And because my faith is in the Lamb's sacrifice, God has received me and I have become righteous. <clears throat> I've said this many times before, but I can't resist saying it again. When God looks at a Christian, the sun gets in his eyes. Only S-O-N. Or uh, when God looks at a Christian, he always uses Christ-colored glasses. You know, my, here are my, I, I see you, but you've got a tint over you now. And that tint is the righteousness of Christ. When God wears his Christ-colored glasses to, to look at you. And what this means is that God is now able to look at you and say, there is a perfect person if I've ever seen one. You are able to enter my family now and my heaven when you die. <clears throat> a story comes out of the Latin American Revolution about how an American soldier was about to be executed uh, by the revolutionaries and they put him before a firing squad and then another American soldier came out with a flag and ran up to this potential victim and wrapped the flag around him and he said to the revolutionaries, if you shoot this man, you're gonna have to fire through the American flag and that will incur the wrath of the entire nation against you. Now, in those days, America was more feared and respected, I think, than it is today. The revolutionaries hesitated, and then finally they let their prisoner go. <clears throat> well, in the same way, if by faith we wrap the Lord Jesus Christ around us, nothing can touch us until it passes through him. If Satan is going to fire one of his flaming missiles at us, he must fear first pierce Jesus, who protects us. Nothing in this world can touch us until it is passed through our Lord. God always sees us dressed in the righteousness of Christ, but to protect yourself against attacks from the devil that will cripple your ability to glorify God, you have to put on the breastplate of righteousness every day. Now, I wanna show you three things that the breastplate of righteousness will protect you against if you wear the breastplate of Christ's righteousness. First of all, Satan will accuse you before God. In Revelation 12, 10, Satan is called the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night. <clears throat> Picture this scene on the judgment day. A sinner saved by grace through faith in Christ comes before God's throne. Satan confidently smiles and says, look at his filth. His heart is deceitful, his mind is corrupt, his mouth is an open grave. I see no filth, God replies. He has been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Then look at his flaws, Satan continues. He was unfaithful to his wife and a deadbeat dad. He often neglected prayer, the Bible, and church. He failed to show love and kindness to many people. God looks at the man and answers, I see no flaws. He is dressed in the righteousness of my son and he stands faultless before me. Then look at the facts, Satan screams in desperation. This person has disobeyed you tens of thousands of times. He has broken your laws in his thoughts, in his words, and in his actions. He has lied, cheated, stolen and cursed, he even went to prison. I can give you a whole book of dates and times to document these facts. 
The only fact I see, God says, is that his name is written in my book of life. I erased the record of his sins when he trusted my son Jesus for salvation. And thus, even our enemy who accuses us day and night has no foothold in the courtroom of God. We don't have to fear his accusations. Now, in the eyes of God, every Christian is already covered in the breastplate of righteousness, whether we put the breastplate of righteousness on or not. Your salvation is safe in Christ, but your feelings are not safe. And that's where Satan attacks you. To protect yourself from feelings of God rejecting you and despising you, you need to wear the breastplate of righteousness. And then a second thing it will protect you from, Satan will accuse you through the voice of other people. People love to criticize other people who are serving the Lord. I wanna show you a cartoon that I think is hilarious. The pastor's shaking hands with people out the front door of the church after the morning worship service, and this later tells him, lady tells him, it was boring, too long, too loud, and it offended me, and that was just your tie. <laughs> Sounds like she's criticizing the sermon, doesn't it? <laughs> well, that just sort of illustrates how, how people like to criticize other people. I wonder how often the Apostle Paul met Christians whose family members he had put to death before he came to Christ. And when he did meet those family members, did they walk all over him with criticism? How dare you call yourself a Christian and an apostle, Paul? You murdered my son. Job's three friends accused him of secret sins because he was suffering. Everyone in Scripture who did a great work for God was accused of sins they did not commit. Even Jesus was accused of being demon-possessed, a blasphemer, a glutton, and a drunkard. Years ago, a society for the spread of atheism made a tract with some sketches of Old Testament people combined with descriptions of their sins. One picture was of Abraham, and the pamphlet pointed out that Abraham was willing to let his wife be raped to save his own life, yet he was called the friend of God. The atheists asked, what kind of God would have a friend like Abraham? Another picture was of Jacob. He was described as a liar and a cheat, yet God called himself the God of Jacob. <clears throat> Moses was portrayed as a murderer, yet God appointed him as the leader of Israel. David was shown to be an adulterer who compounded his sin by orchestrating the murder of the woman's husband. Yet David was called a man after God's own heart. The atheists asked, what kind of God could he be who would be pleased with people like Jacob and Moses and David? Too bad those atheists didn't say anything about Jesus. If they had read their New Testaments, they would have discovered that God's character and reputation of loving sinners were vindicated in the death of Christ. Because Jesus died on the cross, God can forgive and cleanse ungodly people like Abraham, Jacob, Moses, and David. Oh yeah, and, and you and me too. You need to be wearing the breastplate of righteousness when other people criticize you. Now, even if they're right about you, you can reply to them, <clears throat> yes, I did that terrible thing. I'm a sinner, but Jesus came to save sinners like me, and I'm trusting in his righteousness 
to make me acceptable to God. And then here's the third accusation the breastplate will protect you against. Satan will accuse you through your own voice. Sometimes we punish ourselves with guilt, but if we've already confessed that sin to God and repented of it, we have no more guilt. But we don't let ourselves off the hook that easily, do we? A woman once told me that in her youth, she was not only a drug addict, but she turned to many other people onto drugs. She became a Christian and left that old life behind, but she said she was never able to forgive herself for the spiritual damage she had caused in the lives of many other people. I suggested to her that because she had come to Christ in faith, God had truly forgiven her. So her feelings of shame were coming from Satan. No matter how spiritually mature you become, Satan will never stop condemning you. Satan's plan in this is to bury you in shame. When you slip into some sin, Satan will tell you, do you really think that God loves the kind of person who does the terrible thing you just did? God is holy and you are rotten. God is good and you are evil. Face it. God is disgusted with you. That's when the shame sets in and you lose your fellowship with God. Unless you're wearing the breastplate of Christ's righteousness. Then you can tell the devil, I did commit that sin and I have no excuse for it. But instead of looking at my sin, I choose to look at my Savior, Jesus. I don't trust in my own record to please God. I trust in Jesus' perfect record. I don't trust in my feelings and I don't trust in my experiences. I trust in Christ alone. So before you can bury me in shame, Satan, you'll have to find fault with Jesus because his righteousness is my breastplate. Now let's pause here for a minute and ask this question. Aren't we supposed to feel shame for our sins? Well, yes, but once God forgives you in Christ, you shouldn't live in shame. Guilt drives us to the cross and places our faith in the blood of Christ that covers our sins. Shame convinces us that we are flawed, stupid, and there's no solution to our problem. Now, if Satan can't bury you in shame, he'll try an opposite approach. Instead of accusing you, he'll congratulate you. He'll tell you, I have to hand it to you. You're doing a great job in your Christian life. You go to church every Sunday. You've put in the hard work on your marriage for many years. And even though this is your second marriage, the divorce you went through was all the fault of your first spouse. You're much better than other people. Your neighbors, the Smiths, never go to church. Your boss, Joe, doesn't know the first thing about the Bible, and you're a Bible teacher. Most other couples you know have failed in their marriages, and even if they're still in their first marriage, they don't practice love for their partners as well as you loved your first partner. In that line of attack, Satan is tempting you to wear the breastplate of self righteousness and we've already seen the damage that that will do but if you've put on the breastplate of righteousness Christ's righteousness you can reply to this line of attack by saying Satan you're trying to make me believe that I'm good enough for God but I don't buy that lie I'm just a sinner saved by the grace of my Savior Jesus 
I refuse to be proud of myself because I know my standing with God depends on Jesus' righteousness and not my own. On the bottom line, there's only one thing that's going to send you to hell. Your own righteousness. You, you thought you were good enough. And there's only one thing that will get you into heaven. Christ's righteousness. That, that's how simple it is. <clears throat> you can see then that putting on the correct breastplate of righteousness will dictate where you spend eternity. So be sure to strap on the breastplate of Christ's righteousness. I'm going to quote, close by reading to you a poem written by Robert Murray McShane titled, Jesus, My Righteousness. And this poem sums up everything I've been saying here in this message today. And I even want to point out ahead of time that near the end of this poem, it talks about how uh, Christ's, Jesus' righteousness is my breastplate, which is, you know, what we've been talking about today. So it refers to this verse we've been in today. So listen, here it is, Jesus, my righteousness. <clears throat> I once was a stranger to grace and to God. I knew not my danger and felt not my load. Though friends spoke in rapture of Christ on the tree, Jesus, my righteousness, was nothing to me. When free grace awoke me by light from on high, then legal fear shook me. I trembled to die. No refuge, no safety in self could I see. Jesus, my righteousness, my Savior must be. My terrors all vanished before the sweet name. My guilty fear banished. In boldness I came to drink at the fountain, life-giving and free. Jesus, my righteousness, is all things to me. Jesus, my righteousness, my treasure and boast. Jesus, my righteousness, I ne'er can be lost. In you shall I conquer by flood and by field. My cable, my anchor, here it comes, my breastplate and shield. When treading the valley, the shadow of death, this watchword shall rally my faltering breath. For while from life's fever my God sets me free, Jesus, my righteousness, my death song shall be. That's what it's all about. Heavenly Father, we thank you for providing for us a righteousness in Christ because we certainly have none of our own. And may everyone in this room be able to say, Jesus, my righteousness, is all things to me. In Christ's name we pray, amen.